<laughs> no, no, it's not the typical Hungarian accent. Is, is it? I don't know. Maybe it's my own version. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it's it, do do all the others. Do you recognize some typical Hungarian accent? No, do you? I yeah. I, I couldn't it's tell this... the difference between any of any kind of <laughs> those area accents. To be honest. Mm, yeah, be because uh, yeah. I I don't have I don't have a typical Hungarian accent either because well uh, I'm bi bilingual bilingual practically I don't know can any can you hear any kind you do hear that my English is not my mother tongue but mm -hmm. do you hear what kind of accent do you hear? Not German, <laughs> but anything I would pick. Uh, yeah, probably I, I do speak German a lot, but a lot better than my mother tongue, which is Hungarian. So, yes, <laughs> but it's I think it's not a typical Austrian accent either, because uh, mm. if I if if it were an Austrian accent, I wouldn't say I, I would say a. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm not too sensitive to accents. <laughs> <laughs> Ian, uh, in particular, has a very typical broad uh, New Zealand accent. Some would say that English is not his first language either, either but um, then again, I'm a Kiwi too, so <laughs> we'll just live with we'll just live with the ribs. I, I hope that you you can understand me. Uh, we're very famous famous for my, only having one vowel sound. <laughs> uh. <laughs> um, Yes. So back to highlight recovery. Mm -hmm. mm. Yes. So um... Um, maybe just just one quick remark to your accent, Ishwan. I think your I I am hearing something a Swiss accent. Who? I don't think uh, I have been skewed in the past few years. I don't know. Okay, um, Ian, please start. <laughs> <laughs> so I um I do a kind of a play around with with G mic um, filters um, for all kinds of things. I, I had did a lot of kind of noise reduction experiments a while ago, um, and then then I started playing around with some highlight recovery things. Um, posted a, a thread on the forum uh, and um, from that um, Hanno from the forum was a dark table developer contacted me about um, putting some of the ideas into dark table so we've been um, <laughs> so <laughs> I've been trying to explain to him from my point of view, uh, and he's been trying to to understand what I'm saying, but we we have no language in common in terms of um, he's he's C plus, <laughs> and I don't understand any of that. And um, I'm just use G mic, and that's got nothing in common. So we kind of stumbled forward. Um, and then Garage Coder from the forum has also kind of jumped in and has um, been uh, I don't know doing some things in Darktable, <laughs> I'm not sure, because um, I don't uh, understand <laughs> what's going on there. So um, uh, can you see Can you see my screen well enough? Mm -hmm. um, yes. I think it's... Uh, so, um, so I've been doing two things. One is um, with dealing with highlights where not all of the channels are clipped. And another thing which is dealing with the highlights when all channels are clipped. So we'll just look at the partial clipping one. So here you should be able to see uh, um, an image with that you get when there's no highlight recovery, that you get the magenta highlights because the the um, 
some channels are clipped and then you apply white balance and the color goes all wonky. Um, and then this is the result of one of the tests from, from Dark Table, um, which you, you can see is much better. Um, the, the basic idea I had was that um, if you know what the color should be, then it doesn't matter if one channel is clipped and you've lost that data. If you know what the color should be, you can figure out the ratios. The problem is figuring out what the color should be. Um, because you've got pixels from all around the clipped area. And obviously, the, for example, the, 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 the um, you know, let me, I should be able to draw here. Yeah. So the, the, the pixels from this, from this post are not the color of the sky. <laughs> so we need some way of distinguishing which pixels are which. And my basic idea is that you pick the color from the area on the outside of the clipping, which is the smoothest area. So um, from up here somewhere, because there's, there's no edges, that's the most likely color for the area that you want to fill in. Um, if I'd switch over to, so um, this is another test image that looks, that's, mm. that's what it looks like um, without any highlight recovery. And then this is one of the, at some stage during the process, I'm, I, well, I think we've, there's been more progress since this result. Um, but this this is a, another good example where uh, we want to we want to um, fix the sky, um, but we don't want to take any pixels from around yeah. here. Um, and there's only a tiny little bit of unclipped sky up here where we want to take the pixels from. But using the principle that we find the area of that's most smooth, um, then it does mean that we, we take the pixels from, from this up corner up here. Ian, um, got a question there. Yes. Um, we've also got, as part of that um, clipped area, you've also got quite a bit of cloud content. Yes. Um, so if you are going to be nominating the color that you have there top right circled, you're going to be losing some of the cloud content, aren't you? The, it, it will go blue if you yeah. if you pick a blue color. Um, in this situation, the highlights are being desaturated. Right, OK. Um, so the assumption is that the whole of the clipped area is one color. Ah. Um, which is not always true, but you have to make an assumption <laughs> somewhere. Um, is it not true that the uh, initial idea of highlight recovery is if you've got the two channels that are not clipped, you look at neighboring pixels, um, which have got all three channels and try to reconstruct a very close pixel, which has got one channel clipped on the basis of the complete unclipped pixel nearby no we, we no no we don't we we're not picking nearby ones necessarily no. um we're picking so for each clipped area we look at all of the pixels around the boundary of that mm -hmm. and we look at the smoothest area and we use that color as a reference color okay um, for the correction. So, so for example, um, anywhere along this area, we're not picking using the pixels from in here that are close um, because that's the the my the, the theory is that um, in the clipped area, the smoothest transition into the clipped area is probably or most likely to be the same object. 
and when there's a sharp transition into the clipped area, um, that's probably a, an edge or a boundary to a different object. Yeah. Does, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And also, the if you uh, choose um, an area that's too close, it might be partially clipped or like there's something going on there too. So you, oh, you yes, would want yes. to choose somewhere that's further away, but also so, of the same part of the uh, subject. Hmm. Yes. Um, so there's, there's, there's when if you've got chromatic, chromatic aberration or um, <laughs> we're actually, the, the way we're doing it is we are, because um, we're doing it on the Bayer pattern, we're not doing it on a demo demosaic image. Um, and what we're actually doing is creating four color channels. Um, so if you're familiar with the Bayer pattern, it, it might be red, green. Um, you've got you've got four <laughs> you've got four pixels. You might have red, green, green, blue. So we're taking each of those and creating four color channels. The problem with that is um, the edge alignment is going to be off because you're moving pixels that are under each other, which aren't actually under each other on the sensor. So um, you have to be a little bit careful about selecting the the um, what we call the candidate pixel um, because your edges are, are all screwed up. You have to actually uh, if you were detecting an edge, you have to actually expand the area that you and disqualify pixels close to the edge, not exactly on the edge, because the edge alignment is all messed up. <laughs> Does that make any sense? Yeah, you can. You guys can explore if you want um, with any uh, any of the fill fill functions um, in uh, GMIC or GMIC. And you would find that um, if if the distance for um, picking the candidate patches is really short, you would notice there's a lot of staircasing of the edges um, that go in, and it will look really ugly, like it won't be a smooth patch. So you guys can play with that um, on your own time, and uh, you, you'll see what uh, we mean by um, just uh, choosing the appropriate um, patch. Um, as a candidate pixel to to fill in the um, the gap, I think. Uh, but I think um, was it Martin? I think you were asking. Um, uh, your question leads to another question. Um, if you fill in um, the part where you want to fill in, it does it, it does it also create some of the detail if there's um, existing channels. I think yes, that yeah. that is the corollary uh, question. So if um, if we if you've got a, a, a red, green, and blue channel, um, and if you know what the ratio between those channels are, and and you lose one of those channels, but you still know the ratio, you can um, you can repair that. For example, if you know that the sky is supposed to be blue, but you're missing the <laughs> you're missing, and you know the exact blue that it's meant to be, then you can you can um, take any of the other other channels. Say you've only got the red channel. Um, if you've got the red channel and you know that the ratio between red and green is two to one, for example, then you can rebuild the green channel. Um, does no, that that's sense? not exactly what I was getting at. Um, I was getting at the cloud, clouds. So if there are clouds, there's there's a certain pattern to the. Um, uh, yes, but but all the that. detail from the known channels is transferred into. Oh, okay, the, okay, yeah, okay. Because the. Yeah, the, I just um, wanted clarification. I understand, um, but uh, for the audience who will be watching oh, the video oh, after, yes. yeah, yeah, yes, good. Um, that's the ideal situation. <laughs> Um, but you, you, so it's not, you're not just painting in a big wash of color. We're, we're looking at the ratios between the channels and using the, 
and the detail gets transferred from one channel to the to the other. Okay, um, Ian, you've got another yes. query there. Mm -hmm. um, Go ahead. You've got um, okay. Let's arbitrarily say we're talking eight bit color. Uh, so you've got two fifty five is clipping, uh, and let's say you've got uh one channel let's say the blue is completely clipped um but your red and green are let's say i don't know at 200 or so if you know the ratios you're saying you can reconstruct so you would do that by effectively i don't know multiplying by 0 0.8 or something like that the red and the green values so that you can get the blue in within gamut is that the idea Oh no! No, there's no gamut. <laughs> this well, is what the, we, you create all kinds of in ratio. You, but the problem is that you 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 are recreating clip data, so that so the if you could completely 100 percent accurately recreate that clip data, you're going to be creating data above 255. Yeah. Okay. Um. So. In, in some, so in, in, in dark table, it's dealing, it's everything is squished into the range, zero being black and one being white. Yeah. Um, in some cases, I've done experiments and I've got values at like 30. <laughs> because because the, the um, if you've got like a very saturated color, um, that has, that has um, clipped, then you've got a very big ratio between the known channels and the clipped channel. Um, so the ratio you might, like I said, you might have a thirty to one ratio between the unclipped channels and, and the clipped channel, and so you end up with these massive values, which need to be, which is um, something that needs to be considered when you're when you're working with the with the algorithm there <laughs> okay but Ian, um, if you're going to get at the same chroma value so that you you know you're getting the same color like you bring that top right corner of blue yes. um to get the same chroma value uh and come up with something that falls within gamut you're effectively going to have to scale the known channels significantly down so that all three channels that you then are presenting red blue and green yeah. are all within gamut right well as we're working on the bayer data yeah it's no real color data it hasn't been transformed into any known color space uh-huh okay um so you you can you can just scale the values that you you end up with scale that 30 down to one you're back in business with a very dark okay. image um but yeah, we're not we're not working. This is prior to any color space conversion or gamut. This is this is the raw data from the sensor, um, and there there will be issues further down the pipeline if you're creating this kind of white. You're you're doing your best guess at what should be there, which means the values could be wonky. They could be wrong. They could be well out of gamut. Um, and you could have a significantly different chroma value from what you think the color actually should be. Yes. Well, you can see that in this image here. Um, here we have mm. the wrong color of sky. Um, and the reason for that is um, there are no good pixels around that border. Mm -hmm. um, we're looking for the smoothest pixel around that border. There are no smooth pixels, which means that the, the um, you have to use some other estimate um although um if we go back to this image you can there's one of the things we do is is um we can we combine um clipped areas so for, so for example this area here inside the lamppost um it gets combined and then we use that this same candidate pixel as the reference if that makes sense um otherwise otherwise you end up with strange colors in all of these all of these different areas um so we allow the um close clipped sections to be 
effectively be treated as one section and use the same candidate color. Um, so, uh, so before we were asking you questions, uh, what else did you have to say? <laughs> Let's just continue with what, what you were planning to say. And then we can uh, ask more questions after. I think I think that's mostly the um, oh that that's mostly the highlight stuff with where you've got one channel at least one channel unclipped. Although there was one thing I just thought, oh, don't let it slip my mind. Oh. Ah, uh, yes. Um, you do end up with some artifacts on the boundaries um, because there's not off. You can end. Uh, I'm not sure if we can see any of it in this image, but you can end up with like a, sh a sharp transition. Um, because we're assuming that the whole clipped area is one color. Um, so you can end up with, uh, oh, you can just see it there. Hang on. Where's my, there we go. So oh, <laughs> that was too much, wasn't it? Um, oops. You can sort of, you can see a hard, kind of a hard line. Uh, whoops. <laughs> that wasn't what I wanted to do. Uh, you, uh, I don't know if that's... Is if there a Zoom good. tool? I think there's a Zoom tool. Somewhere. There is a Zoom tool, but I, I messed it up. Okay. Um, Matt, oh, there might be another area. I, I'm, the problem is I'm really familiar with these images, and so I know where I'm looking to try and find these these artifacts. Um, and I know what I'm looking for. Um, I don't know if I can find any there. Um, but because uh, oh, there was, uh, let, uh, there wasn't, yeah, uh, <laughs> I don't think I've got a good example of it, but this technique does not work when you've got changes in the color in the clipped area. Because, for example, there was an image on the forum of some clipping in, in a sunset, and, and the sky gradually fades down from, from um, blue to red. So at the top of the clipped area, you've got kind of a blue um, hue, color, and at the bottom, it's, it's red. And so if we pick a blue color and assume the whole clipped area is blue, then you're going to get this very hard line at the boundary of the red area of the clipping. Does, does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Especially even if the the gradient is gradual, if you fill in with a pretty solid or fuzzy color, it'll still be very obvious that where the yes. filling is. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So so I mean that's that's because we're making an, an assumption about the about the clipped area being the same color. Yeah, and um, also I think it, it can be mitigated. Um, like say if it, you know, your algorithm makes it to uh, dark table, you know, we can um, we can mask. But I'm not sure whether the mask can be um, like can it be a gradient mask? I'm not sure. I, I don't I don't use dark table. Uh, do any of you know? I'm I'm not that familiar with that October. Okay, I, you know it is possible to to make it work, um, I mean, but the, the make it the, less obvious. Let's just say. Yes, yes, and 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 there's work going into like blurring the boundaries and and stuff to make it less obvious. Um, but there are cases where <clears throat> where where um, it just doesn't. <laughs> it's going to be really difficult. Um, the okay, thanks, Garrett. Uh, yeah, uh, oh, what was it? so um, highlight recovery is a case of picking your poison. Um, you're making a guess, and you, you're basically choosing um, 
one one type uh, and not you can choose clipping artifacts or you can choose highlight recovery artifacts um uh but you um and then you can choose which highlight recovery artifacts you 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 choose um but that's basically the choices you have you're not you're not going to get a perfect recovery basically i kind of think of it as you're disguising the clipping area with something plausible rather than um getting a uh, you know what should have been there you're getting something that is a good guess about what should have been there um uh let, let's talk about the um completely clipped areas this is one of the test images that i use and what you're looking at is um the minimum value of red green and blue channels so um the and this is a this is a reconstruction of the the completely clipped areas um and if i show you and, and the reason i'm showing you this first is um because it's a little bit difficult to tell which areas uh were actually clipped in the first place so if i sh if i <laughs> that's the image before the reconstruction um at the same brightness level so you can see all the, all of the flat gray areas are the clipped regions um so that's the that's with the reconstruction <laughs> which, I, which i'm quite pleased about um uh so the the idea behind uh this um is to take the um the uh let's get my drawing on so you've got to you take the you look at the the whoa what have i done oh <laughs> i am drawing i i was expecting purple i've only got a grayscale image but anyway that'll do so you've got this boundary here and you look at the 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 gradient of the pixels at the boundary and then you can sort of project the the um what what you expect it to be into the clipped region there's a big problem there's lot well there's lots of problems with that um and because again you have to make an assumption that the the boundary of the clipped region is of the same object um whereas in some cases it's not um for example along the if you look at along the jaw up along the jaw there um it goes straight from the background into the clipped area so you don't get much good information to propagate that way so my solution is to look at all the is to um uh do the propagation uh in one direction and then do it in the other direction find the minimum value of those propagations so so in one direction you end up with uh if you do <laughs> if you have a graph you end up with pixel values something like that where you've got um and then in the other direction you end up with that and then you take the minimum and you end up with that kind of shape which is a, a reasonable approximation and then you do it in the up up and down and you get the other axis and oh, i actually i tried lots of ways to combine the horizontal and vertical reconstructions and i think i'm just doing an average at the moment i think that was my latest the, the no 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 i actually end up with some fancy weighting scheme um between them which i can't remember because it's been a while is it closer to a median of some sort no 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 yeah. no there's, there's a weighting with the distance from the edges and 
Oh, a so, distance algorithm. Okay. So if you if the um, we don't need to know exactly what it is, but uh, what there, category there, of uh, there's there's a, yeah there's a weighting based on the distance. Okay. De and depending on which axis um, it is. Uh, so how many axes 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 are you um are you looking at? So the um there's a horizontal uh reconstruction which which where we do the hor in one direction and then in the other direction and find the the minimum of those two reconstructions in the horizontal direction and then we do the same thing in the vertical direction and then we do a, a weighting um of those to get the final result um okay. based on, it, on and it's it. because we, you're still working uh in the rggb right no th this is a grayscale oh yeah um, yeah you're right the, right but but a, I'm, a I'm asking okay so it's after so it's this, just this on, is on yeah it's it's not on this, the raw data this one oh no this this is again deal uh originally it was on the raw data okay um but they might the, the they it's probably not going to be end up like that in dark table if if they um end up implementing it because yeah of other issues <laughs> <laughs> I, i'm asking for the audience right like just people yeah, yeah, yeah. curious because the, the well, one before was in uh using the raw data right yes this will be using yeah. the raw data this will be okay okay prior to, uh, most likely prior to demosaicing okay but um yeah you you have other things going on like that you need to sort out before it can be in dark table for example that's oh, what yes, the, yeah. the, all the color stuff that we talked about that's being worked on this is on the back burner might okay eventually... yeah this is less important than the more spectacular implementation <laughs> okay <laughs> yeah okay if, go on if you if you have to rebuild things that are completely clipped you might want to go back and and look at your photography skills <laughs> um, rather than technology to fix your mistakes um uh, now where was i right so um that's the basic principle uh that's the original image and somewhere i have no that's <coughs> excuse me so that's the image with the clipping this shows the distance from the so each pixel value represents the distance from the top clipped edge does that make sense so in the clipped area um so there's there's uh the clipped area you can see and then um the pixel value increases uh hang on let me so this is a representation so the let's say the clipped edge is there and then the pic these pixel values are counting the distance from that clipped edge and so this is a very big distance because it's bright this is a dark low distance for representing one pixel um, does that make sense? Um, so you can project in the, if you know the gradient at this clipped edge, then you can multiply the gradient by the distance and you get uh, that projection into the clipped area in one direction in this case from the top down now the problem with this is you end up with these like this bound boundaries here between two different areas where which is actually supposed to be a smooth part of the cheek so um 
So instead of using just the raw distance down from the edge, I the further away from from the edge you get, the more blurring I do of the distance. <laughs> Is this making sense? So yeah, you can very smart the... way of doing it. Yes, yeah, so, so this is effectively showing us how you are weighting. So this is the result of your weighting algorithm. Is that right, Ian? No, no, not yet. No, not yet. Okay. Um, so um, we can the we can pro project the um, the gradient at the edge of the clipping into the clipped area, and the result of um, and for each pixel inside the clipped area. The new value will be the gradient multiplied by the distance. That's, um, but if we just use the raw distance, like in this image, you get weird artifacts like you have here, you know, along along these areas here, where there's a you get a the distance part of the calculation is quite different from pixel to pixel. You get a so, Manhattan background. <laughs> yeah. Um, so what I so what I do is I blur the values of the distance. Actually, ba uh, based on the distance. <laughs> so um, what that means is that the when you're multiplying the gradient by the distance, you're actually multiplying it by kind of an average distance does that make sense the result is that you get a much smoother more even surface and you don't get those big discrepancies from pixel to pixel uh, is, are you following me <laughs> um yeah so we so um we do that so we use that calculation from the top down and then from the bottom up and take the minimum value there and then we do it from left to right and from right to left and take the minimum value there and then once we have the the vertical and horizontal versions then we use the weighting to put them together um, to get the result which is that one and this one i've added a little bit of noise <laughs> <laughs> um because it, it to make it look a bit more realistic um and i'm pretty pleased with those results considering that there's hardly any data uh there it it's it's another one of those things where you you're creating something plausible that could be there rather than trying to create a perfect um I mean, you're missing the data, so you're making it up. And so you're making something that's plausible. You're inventing something that is less distracting than clipping. And so I, I guess that's that's everything I have to say about that, <laughs> um, unless you've got any other questions. Yeah, it looks really good um, com in comparison. You know, there, there are those really light edges. Um, or light uh, artifacts, but um, yeah, yeah. There, there's a lot, some post um, editing that can be done to deal with those. Um, but overall, it, it, yeah, it looks like those areas weren't clipped to begin with. So it's nice. Yeah. Um, I mean, certainly a vast improvement. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, one it's... question I had, um, oh, uh, one question I had about the, um, the color image, um is um will you consider uh adding maybe labeling to to the algorithm i think it would um do do quite well um for problematic areas or are you you know that that would be uh for for another algorithm i guess what what do you mean by labeling um well there's a lot of um kind of recovery or just um machine learning kind of things where 
where people you know choose choose their candidate uh, areas instead of having yeah. the algorithm do that um so you know for the most part your your algorithm is pretty good but um you know like the around the tree um area yes. um yeah i'm wondering if that's you know um needs work or future research area for you uh well, or am i piling I think, it on too much <laughs> i mean that that requires that requires like a, a significant kind of user interface interaction <laughs> type thing yeah i i generally want to stay with, away from that but um i I'm just thinking it would be a way to empower the user. Um, well, yeah, yeah. The um, one of the things I was thinking is that um, if you if you're creating artifacts in your highlight recovery, you want those artifacts to be easily fixable, which is which. Um, which so having a block, a, an ear, a, a block of solid color that's the wrong color, that's easily selectable later on in post production further down the pipeline, is more preferable than some kind of blurry mess that's you need lots of feathering and fine detail work to mask in. Um, so so that area of the sky in the in the trees, which is the wrong color, that's that's reasonably easy to select in, in some other editing Yeah, yeah program. that, that so, is quite true. Um, so yeah, it's not worth the effort to to add labeling or um, candidate choosing because um, the solution to solving the wrong color is just to either shift or balance it um, in post. Um, so yeah, that's a good point. Um, I mean that's that's the um, I mean in the 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 um, algorithm does label all of the clipped areas as individual areas um, so you can assign a candidate to the to each area so it might be possible to to spit out a mask of the clipped areas or or something like that but um yeah i'm just thinking about um how uh what what is in uh, gimp um there's there's like cloning and what was the other one um healing healing yeah so something something similar to that would would be I think a lot of users would appreciate that. Like, although you know what goes on behind the curtain is, uh, you know, your your business. But, um, oh yeah, I yeah. see. So you yeah, where you select an area you want to copy the information from into. Yeah, yeah. To to area. kind of select a candidate um, for areas as dramatic as the uh, the corner uh, where the tree is. So. Mm. I think people would really appreciate that. They'll they'll call it magic, but you know, magic. <laughs> you know the sufficient well, when, sufficient one of the science things, yeah one of the things magic. that's in the in the interface in the dark table interface at, at the moment well last time i heard um is the how close clipped areas you can set the radius of of the areas that join if so in the other image here where we're talking about joining these these individual clipped areas, you can set how big the radius is between the areas that you want to treat as the same area. So there is some control. Um, so so for this area, for example, which has quite a thick border, um, might you'd need to increase the radius of it between. Um, between the to make sure that the areas are uh, considered one area whereas yeah so it can leap leap over yes so to speak yes. yeah um so the <laughs> uh let, so 
so it's basically it's basically just dilating the um the clipped area um so hang on uh, so uh, let me fill that with that and then do that. so you might have a clipped area uh, there and another clipped area there <laughs> and then it's just a simple operation of going uh dilate and just keep doing that except <laughs> that's probably too far away but you can see the areas are growing and eventually they'll join up do that enough times and now now it's treated as one area yeah di dilate and erode which is close or open i always get confused uh so so dilate yeah. is growing bright areas erode is shrinking bright areas opening and then, is yeah and closing is a dilate and then erode and the so other dilate, one is, yeah so dilate erode is what I can't remember which one's opening and which yeah, one's Yeah, yeah, I always forget which one. Yeah, it's like which I, I had the memory of which operation comes first, and then that's the whether it's open or closed, but I forget. Yeah. Um, but you would have to do open or closed, right? Because right yes, now you're expanding yes. it, and then... Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so... so um, But so... Um, but that, that, that clipped area, that clip... That, so I was saying each clipped area gets its own label. So now that area, this area gets labeled one, for example, and then there's another area over here which gets labeled two. Okay. Um, whereas before the before that, you would have um, this would be one, that would be two, and this would be three. Yes, makes sense. And so they'd be separate areas. So so there is some control about which areas. Um, get joined together so if we go back to this one for example uh you might uh so this one or the in this example obviously had a very small radius because you can see that uh you can see that this area here is not is is kind of a greeny color rather than a, the blue of the sky and you can see that um, this clipped area here is different from the rest of the sky over here. So these weren't joined together in this example, but they could have been if you adjust, if the user and user had set a bigger radius, then this would have joined with that, and that might have joined with this, and that might have joined with this, and eventually you might have all got to there and got blue in that area. Um, but the the issue with that is um you might end up joining areas in other parts of the image that shouldn't be joined uh, yeah um uh, i have a question so this is um just because i'm i i, I this is a, a filter for gimmick is do i understand this correctly i essentially prototyped it um uh, i mean which which program is this is this a completely new program or is is this something a filter for gimmick or yeah so i i i made is, some is it... things in, in for gimmick mm -hmm. um um for my own entertainment mm -hmm. um and now some of the users from the forum are actually taking the ideas and putting them into dark table Mm -hmm. But now, right now, this is something that users can use, is it? No, not at the moment. Okay, so it it does not it does not have a user interface or something like that. The, it's just... the dark the dark table developers have, in their version that they're working on, mm -hmm. um, have have a little. They've been experimenting with what to put into mm -hmm. the user interface, but. Yeah, I'm just asking because I'm seeing that you have uh, GIMP open, and so I, I'm just wondering how does this actually work. So it's not really for users; it's just no, uh, no. It's it's being developed, and okay, it's, hopefully it's just... will be in Darktable eventually. Okay, okay. Yeah, for I think for um, if you have a raw image and you um, 
export it as is. Uh, could you uh, work work the magic uh, using uh, Gimmick or GMIC with uh, GIMP? Um, Can you do that before? And then it has that crude um, GMOSIC sing algorithm, right? That's That's how I've been doing my experiments. The problem with that is that you have you would have to duplicate all the rest of the pipeline that you get in like dark table for free which is um converting it into a color space yeah yeah um, and all the other yeah everything that has stuff. to be done has to be done manually to to get yeah. the results so it's not like you you press a button and it you know boom everything comes together yeah yeah so uh, yeah i've been i've been loading up um I've been using uh, was not um, raw raw digger. I think we'll spit out the raw data straight from a, an image just into a, a, into a non un, completely unprocessed processed TIFF file. So you get the Bayer pattern and everything in there, and then I've been using that to do my experiments. Okay, um, and you can do that with uh, DC raw. You can um, export yes, uh, yes. it using document mode. Um, so there's yeah. a lot of different methods to do that. Um, the The point is, you know, uh, the the light, the highlight recovery, or like the clip recovery, does work um, if you want to try it. But it's just it's just more experimental because you don't have the rest of the pipeline to to work with um, without going through everything manually. So um, you uh, could you the code is already there, um, uh, but it's just uh, yeah how much you want I'm to play not, around with it. I, there there is some if uh, let me. Let me just see, because I, I have all of my own personal experiments um, on my own personal computer that aren't available. And so what have okay, I... Okay, so they're not all on um, community. Right? Uh, so so there, there is some things in, in my... If you go to testing, Ian Ferguson... Yeah, could you just quickly uh, show us visually? Um, just open it up and show us which algorithm or which um, uh, filters that we, if we're interested in, uh, could experiment with. Do you have it in this installation? I, I, it's not. It's not. I haven't. Um, okay. How about this? Um, you could. You could just. You could just um, write it in the thread. Then we can just. For the curious, they can just uh, look it up, um, look at what you write in your post. Um, the um, like, I've got a lot of stuff on my computer that's not available. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I I realize <laughs> that. Just if there's anything that's uh, already available, just uh, give us a yeah, I, you know, I, direct us to that. I don't, I don't, uh, I don't. Think there's anything? That, that that's completely fine. Yeah, mind. yeah. Sometimes, sometimes the thing about uh, uh, GMIC is that um, you know we have a lot of things available. People just don't know about it, or yes, yes. or like you and me, we have a lot of things on our computer that will never, probably never see the uh, <laughs> Siva public release, but they're really cool. So. Um, yeah, uh, just we need to work on that. Just being uh, mm -hmm. more open about what we're doing. Um, yeah, yeah, I, yeah. It's I, I, this is this is something which is pretty specialized. Yeah, <laughs> so that's I, true. That's true too. So yeah, there's not you, too you many need, people who can just pick it up. A, you need to take, you need to get a special type of image into into it before you can actually do it, and then at the end of it, you don't actually have anything. You need to do a whole bunch of processing afterwards yeah, to get yeah. anything usable. So um, this is more about I'm trying to actually what I'm hoping that because I'm not a dark table developer, 
<laughs> um, and I'm hoping that like by sharing these ideas that it can end up useful for someone can take it that's a good idea I want to put that into dark table I'll help put it into dark table and then people will you know eventually get to use some of this stuff rather than me just you know oh I wonder if this will work and playing around with different yeah, yeah. On my computer but I think your presentation has been really helpful. Um, I found that like sometimes when I post something about what I'm doing, uh, yeah, people people catch on and say, you know, I I sort of know the idea. I'll just implement it my own way. So mm. like there's been that too. And this presentation, people can just look, you know, um, uh, kind of review your strategies and and think to themselves, oh yeah, that's what I'm missing from my own algorithm uh in dark table rt or whatever right so well what i will suggest that suggest that might be useful for people is um if you go if you uh let me see what do i want you probably if i pick this is basically do it manually doing what i'm doing if i pick a the color of the sky and then i on a new layer which i've set to hue uh i can uh, it's not i can this is i can paint over there and sort of get some kind of is hue the best maybe maybe color there we go that's better if you set the layer to lch color and pick the candidate pixel and then paint that color over then you get some kind of highlight recovery it's basically the manual version um it's not it's not amazing but um that's the, the similar similar kind of thing if people yeah, you're right. It's actually what home. we've been doing all, all along, but it's just um, made into an algorithm, right? So although yours is obviously more sophisticated, but yeah, that's the general idea. Uh, yeah, it's it's, <laughs> it's not exactly the same, but but yeah, it's, yeah, it's I know. Similar, yeah, yeah, similar results. Yeah. So um, but that's that's the basic idea. Yeah. So that that's all I have to say about that. <laughs> okay, thank you for your presentation. It's been really clear. Uh -huh. Sometimes, you know, when we think about algorithms, it's it's not really hard, uh, easy to to explain everything. But you've been really good at it. Well, thank you, Anna. Do you um, have something to say? Yeah, is the algorithm the code uh, published somewhere? Um, is there a yeah, uh, GitHub or something like that. Where, it, where it can is, potential it developers on, find it? Um, it is on GitHub. I'm not sure exactly. It's not on the main dark table one. There's, I think there's, this might it's be a fork of it's a fork of dark table. Okay, I'm just yes. Um, I let me see. I ah uh, yes. Um. Oh, no, it's not. This, this, this might be the link. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah, this, I think I've seen this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. But the, the, I'm I'm not really keeping up with, with what's going on in Dark Table. Um, 
because it's a bit of a, it's a mystery to me. I've basically been kind of. So you're more of a consultant, right, on this issue? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, and it's 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 kind of out of my hand now. Now that um, the dark table guys understand the concept, I'm mostly hands off. Um, yeah, and it sounds like they have their own ideas too on how to make certain things work. Oh, so they're yeah, just oh, yeah. uh, letting using your idea as a base and then uh, going from there. That's what I'm getting from their their discussions. Yes, yes. Um, I mean that the main thing, the um, it's they've kind of taken yeah they've taken the ideas and they now 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 they kind of understand what the ideas and they've taken it and they're doing their own thing now. Yeah, yeah. You can probably bring some of that back when <laughs> when you do something else, right? So that's the beauty of open source and uh, our community. Well, I'm, I mean, I get, I, um, they they ask my opinion on things, and I've I've spent hours and hours looking at <laughs> clipped highlights and artifacts from clipped highlights. So, um, do you see <laughs> do you see clipped highlights in real life? <laughs> you just uh, <laughs> you just wake up one morning, uh, one one like midnight and sweat all over. Oh, I saw the world differently. <laughs> In my dreams, I, I have to admit that after after like spending some time doing it, I'll go outside and look at the sky to see how it really looks. You know, <laughs> that's you know the the um you know what what do what I'm looking at. Say I'm looking at an image of of clouds that are completely clipped. When I go outside, I'll be fascinated by clouds. <laughs> I'll be like, what do clouds actually look like? rather than recovered clouds <laughs> yeah so so anna you need to take more um more of those landscape uh, images without clipped clouds <laughs> <laughs> for ian to enjoy but well, the one one thing that I, I weird quirk that i had when with doing this is i've been like what well, i've been kind of like okay i'm going to use real images with that are actually clipped rather than you could easily take an image that isn't clipped and then digitally clip it and then you've got a reference and you go <laughs> yeah there's too um, many um of those uh in like scientific papers they always do the artificial um clipping or whatever mm. uh which is good in the sense that it's controlled so they get what they want but the, that's the exact problem right because it's mm. it's what they want and so you have you know you put on your own bias and other things that you know will affect the results right it, or your conclusions so it's well, not the it's best not, way to do it um yeah it's not it's not clipping that's resulted from light that's passed through a lens and got a bit soft and and the colors have slightly changed and gone onto a sensor which isn't perfect and then it's clipped it's we've taken some digital data and we've clipped the data and now we can get that back <laughs> but it's not you, you don't end up with all the little quirks and um inconsistencies Okay, that, that was really helpful. Thanks for coming on to uh, do this presentation. Um, yeah, no, no problem. Yeah, so we were talking about earlier, we were talking about uh, the, the uh, Audubon uh, photographs. Do you, does anyone have any comments on those, the bird photos? Or uh, just, just do, would you me... like to discuss something else? Um, I've seen that thread, but I, I'm not sure if I... It was, it was not spelled correctly. Mm. 
Mm, let's just look at it. Yeah. So, lots of interesting birds. Yeah, I. I... Um, enjoyed the one that um, Pat shared um, and also the other ones where the birds you see the front of the bird um, normally when we take fo see photos we see like the side profile of birds and so mm -hmm. like facing like this yeah. they, they, it look, they look strange right because we're not used to mm -hmm. seeing them head on um, yeah. yeah so there's a bunch that are head on or it's um it's closer to the front yeah so i thought I, that was unique yeah it reminds me mm -hmm. I, I remember seeing like a, like a meme of like the american bald eagle from the front you know the kind of um you know the the american bald eagle it's very patriotic and and magnificent and you know <laughs> and then you if you see it straight on from the front it just looks weird it's the same kind of um, uh, unexpectedness of, of seeing it in a different angle. Yeah, for humans, we always see, um, we always take portraits, right, from the front. So it, you know, it seems odd that we don't take more of that um, with animals, um, right, like straight, straight on, right? So it's, it's really interesting that way. I find that in 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 my photography, um, I, I'm or, I'm thinking about taking pictures of things in a way that you wouldn't normally see it, because that makes it an interesting picture. If you're just taking a picture of something in the way that you see it every day, it's not very interesting. Mm. yeah um although i think i've taken um photos of birds years ago from the front but i kind of uh, i didn't find them interesting somehow this this one is good american wood Woodcock by Hector Cordero. Um, yeah, I, I did take pictures. Which from the number front, is that? Didn't, didn't, it's, it's number one. Are, are you talking about that one? Uh, I'm trying to share my. Yeah, someone has already sh shared this. It's. I'll just scroll down. It's it's number one. Number one. Oh, okay. Here. Down. Then this. You're talking about this one, right? Um, I'm not necessarily. I just mm -hmm. uh, noticed that some there are quite a few that are from the front. Um, so th those are interesting. Um, this one is, yeah, this one is interesting. But there are quite a, uh, there's several of them like that. Um, for this one, it's more, it's including the body. So I guess it's more interesting. But it's interesting in the sense that um, less from the image point of view, but uh, just the point of view that we rarely take these kinds of photos, right? When we're looking at birds, we normally take want to take them in flight or from the side, not from like how we do portraits for humans. Um, yeah, it's um, um. I don't know what the um, the English um, word. It's in German. We say "vermenschlichung." Uh, it's it's like making uh, a, an animal a, a human out of an animal. Anthropomorphization uh, or something like uh, that. Something like that. Yeah. Uh, for mentioned 
uh, yeah, <laughs> it's making animals human. Yes. And also, so giving them sometimes also a, a certain uh, character and certain personality, but which is which is usually not scientific. Just uh, yeah. Yeah, actually, like for a lot of photos, we we do that all the time. Just uh, it's more subconscious and less obvious. Like for this one, it's quite obvious, you know, the perspective. But a lot of times, we put um, our idea of what we think is a good photo, right? Um, okay, let me see. Uh, I enjoyed nineteen as well, mm -hmm. um, where the the smaller bird is kind of like a headdress for the the larger bird. Yeah, this, Sorry, this one, bring uh, it back. 16, so, that's the flamingo. Yeah, that's, okay. that's also interesting. Uh, yeah, 16, uh, yeah, the one I just talked about, yeah, uh, that's, 19. That's, that's, that's great, the number 19 is, is great, yes. And then uh, 20, 20 is like, it's like one, uh, the wings are like one feather kind of thing, although mm -hmm. like it's cement, um, mirrored feather. Like when when we you know when you see um, a feather on the ground, right? So there's like two but feathers. Is, yeah. uh, so this is actually one one bird, and uh, it has yeah, very wings. long wings. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Um. Yeah, I mean, is uh, have you tried to take photos of birds? Because I have, and it's not. It's just so really hard. Easy. Yeah, if you have yeah. like a fast camera, long lens, and good instincts, yeah. then it would work. But I have, I have an entry level camera, and so it's it's really hard. The only thing I can do is just take a photo and then crop it. But then the bird is so <laughs> so small. <laughs> when you blow it up, it looks it doesn't look right. So. But these are like sharp, um, and you know the photographer probably waited for the right moment, or just uh, you know did like a burst shot, like lots and lots of bur burst uh, photography. Yeah, the, the the modern cameras and their burst rates. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they're they're like it's like taking a video basically um, without the uh, what what it, what do you call it the when when you're moving and there's um motion blur no not motion blur uh you know in video when when you take when you move quickly uh what's that rolling shutter rolling shutter yeah yeah so burst is without rolling uh just fast really fast photography without birth, rolling shutter yeah the other ones are pretty like like something you would expect um Oh, maybe the Canada goose from 30, 39 is one of them too. It's from, um, it looks really interesting. It's like a goose head coming out of a rock or island or something. And then that, um, the blur in the water, it's interesting. 39. Mm hmm. Yeah. Oh, and then 41, again, right in the, from the front. Really odd. Yeah. Really strange. Yeah. I don't know what to feel it's about cool. that one. <laughs> it's cool. Yeah. Um, 40, 43 is interesting too. <laughs> Just the uh, uh, extension of the cone. <laughs> not not hatch. Yeah, it's called not hatch. I'm just wondering what's it called in German. I, don't know. I think I some of the, know. some of those uh, some of those images are kind of abstract. It's more yeah. about shapes and colors than than the bird. Yes. Yeah. Like um, like the fifty six. It's you know the bird is well the drop is not coming off of its beak. It's not coming out of from its its eyes. Its eye that would be like. A sad bird, but it's coming off of the beak. Yeah. 
so it's not quite there. I need some time. My my browser has has not loaded that one yet. Oh, really? So really? I need some yeah, time. Yeah, I'm, I'm I'm right next 55? to the. Um, Suppose wait, I'm sharing. I, I jumped around I'm really sharing. quickly. Yeah. Um, where were you yeah, last? Where were you last? Yeah. I am was... now at, at fifty six. Oh. Loaded. Now. Okay. Okay. 58 is is loaded but 57 has now loaded yes yeah. um yeah i i thought of 56 you know if the water drop was right where the eye is then it would be sad <laughs> but it's off of the beak so it's not that interesting um, yeah i mean it's really difficult to take i mean all, all of these are are really good it's just uh i'm just scrolling through and you know And then sixty six is really cute, <laughs> you know. All all small birds, small animals are generally on the cute side. Like sixty seven. <laughs> oh man, I'm looking. I'm looking at some of these and going, "Oh, those highlights are clipped." <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you could probably, uh, you know, see if the photographer is comfortable with giving you a sample of their raw, <laughs> like a not not so desirable raw. Then then you can play around with it. I, I, I've got plenty of not so desirable raws. <laughs> it's so easy, right, to to make not so desirable images. I I I'm also one of the people who don't like deleting things. <laughs> oh yeah. Which was really handy when I needed to find some some images with highlight clipping to, to do tests with, but um, <laughs> it does mean I've got a whole lot of images that I probably shouldn't need shouldn't have kept. Oh, another cute one is uh, ninety two. Uh... It needs time. <laughs> I'm, I'm sharing, so Anna, can't you see it in the meeting? Yeah, oh, I see it now. She, she in, wants to see it all meeting. in its glory. <laughs> yeah, of course, it's not the same. <laughs> and then 95, that, that one's uh, interesting too. Quite interesting. Yeah, I, uh, I always enjoy their... Um, their their photos um although some people i think i read on on the online that's uh uh but Don, like they they have like uh kind of a weird uh what cult, what cult is, like following what, sometimes what is in the beak of that that's a pelican that those are pelicans right yeah it's a fish yes what what is in in its beak a fish it's fish? a fish I think. Yes, but I, I, the perspective is very interesting. You know, the the mo the, I forget what it's called. The, the, the sack is mm -hmm. is kind of like a bowl. Uh, those are all but yeah it's it's yeah, that's american, all it's an american contest or yes they are all yeah it's american, american birds yes but yes you do have some of those birds in europe as well i think oh well, there's so many kinds of birds i'm not really a bird watcher but i know that at least <laughs> um so are there any other threads think, that uh people are interested in um talking just, about i think uh, i think uh, 97 is interesting 97 okay mm -hmm. oh the shy chris shy bird 
Yeah, it's an. I think it's an interesting composition with yeah. just the eye in in the focus in in the center. Yes. Yeah. Yes. yes. It's artistic. On the other yeah, hand, yeah, and, and a lot of birds. Um. Yeah, when birds are like shy or they don't, they're not like kind of open um, to human interaction. They can tend to hide, at least partially. So it's kind of like that, but. The photographer took advantage of that and did a good, uh, made a good frame out of composition out of that. Uh, one really has to be patient to take photos of birds. Yeah, and I find that <laughs> birds, um, we normally, uh, uh, associate birds by like the species or whatever um, but you know individual birds have their own quirks and their own habits so uh, photographers really need to kind of understand that as well um, to to be able to capture uh, great photos it's just like um, you know people dealing with uh, mammals right um, like bears and they all have their own little differences or major differences. Character. They have, character, they also yeah. Have individual character, person, yep. personality. Yep, yep. Yes. Uh, um, yeah, a story comes, comes into my mind. Uh, like a year ago, I was hiking close to Vienna. Uh, and I had been hiking for like several hours and there was a bench and I sat down to have a to rest and along came a woman with a rather big um, almost white dog and so I think it was something like spring or so but uh, well it was not it I mean it was spring and probably a warmer spring day and the dog, um, so I was sitting um, on the bench and the dog just just sat, lay, not, not, he didn't uh, sit down, he just lay, suddenly lay down in the middle of the trail. And so the, the, the woman was pulling the dog, come on, let's continue, let's, let's walk. But uh, the dog wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't get up. And so he, he sat there for several minutes and the woman and I, we started a conversation and oh. she said that he, he always does this and she can pull and, and, and try to make him walk, but he just doesn't get up. And so after a few minutes, actually the, the dog continued to walk, but yeah, that was a, because, um, we say that uh, dogs always uh, uh, obey to their um, owner, but that's not always the case. Yeah. Well, a lot of dogs are really stubborn. <laughs> yeah, speaking, exactly. Speaking as exactly, a, that dog, yeah, that yeah, dog yeah. was really stubborn and and yeah, very yeah. stubborn. Yes. Yeah, my my dog when he's stubborn, he goes like. Uh, you have a dog like too. That. I have With no his mouth, pets. Yeah, just in the purses his mouth. Uh, so it's it's funny. Um, oh, I I wanted to ask about public photography, privacy, and changing attitudes. Uh, has anyone been following that one? Um, I um, know nothing about it. Um, oh, good night, Ian. No, I haven't. It's it's mostly probably about street photography and things like that. Okay. Is I it? thought that was interesting. The I, I I didn't read it. Um, I will, um, but it has you know, long. Well, mostly Leander had like long posts. Um, but uh, yeah. Uh, Pat jumped in. Um, yeah, it's. I think it's maybe worth looking into and maybe participating. Uh... Leander isn't there, isn't here. Yeah, he, he usually he does it's participate. Probably, mm, Maybe it's the timing. 
Yes, I think so. Because he did participate in, in the previous meetings, but now he isn't. He could say a lot about this. Yeah. Well, I wanted to see who, who wanted to, to be here or, or could be here um, at this time. So it mm -hmm. seems like the other time that we use uh, is generally the time that is, is best for most people. But yeah. it, it's great that we got Ian uh, presenting, um, and uh, you know we can post the, this this meeting up so that more people can benefit from his ideas. Um, but next time, maybe we'll go back to the the times that we we set previously, so we can get more people. Um, and maybe there are more people uh, in this time frame. It's just that uh, sometimes, like for members if they sign on or they're always signed on they don't see the pins at the uh, pin post at the top so i mm -hmm. tried to <laughs> strategically post so that it kind of bumps up back to the top mm -hmm. so pe more people will know about our uh event uh speaking of event um our live meetings uh would you like to be more uh consistent with them or uh, just have it as we have had it, just like once in a while, ask and see, gauge the interest of people. Um, I'm not sure. Um, I mean, okay, we, you and I, Alan, you and I, we are doing this together now, aren't we? I guess so. <laughs> I did a lot of yeah, talking so, today. <laughs> so, and, um, yeah, so, but um, yeah, I, I'm interested in like, because I feel like, although some people, like different people have different opinions, but I feel like uh, doing something like this on a semi-regular basis is, um, is community building, right? It's part mm -hmm, of uh, exactly, community yes. building, even community development in the sense that we're sharing ideas, we're bouncing off each other. And I believe that's that's something that helps, you know, engagement and um, improving our getting to know one another. Like if some other people decide to participate, then we get to know them. So yeah. um, um, I, I would like to know. hear from Garrett because he's been quiet and Ishvan. Uh, like, what What are your thoughts on uh, anything? Istvan is actually, he's a bit suspicious because he, <laughs> I don't see his, his, his image moving at all. So it's, it's just, this, <laughs> I think it's just what we're seeing right now is just the same. I don't he's know. He's an AI. Do you he's see AI. <laughs> he's, um... I am here. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so, okay. Um, yes uh, a story <laughs> yesterday i met a, a gentleman he is a monk uh, we've met uh, several times and he is also he is uh, we are writing for the same um, computer journal we are ri writing uh, he mostly about uh, latex and me mostly about photography and so um, somehow it he he lives in vienna i think since one or I think since two years, almost two years. And so um, it was a co coincidence. Actually, it was a, somehow it was a Instagram that that brought us together. And so when I saw, yeah, he's in Vienna. So I just wrote him and, and he uh, suggested that we meet and we did actually meet. And so what we uh, actually it turns out that he is he has been writing for that german computer journals for i don't know more than 15 years and uh, the headquarter of the, the the office of the of the journal is uh, is in munich and he had been even living in munich for several years but he never actually met any of the editors uh, so last year, I actually went to Munich because, well, it's it's um, it's four from here in Vienna. It's four hours by train, so I just uh, uh, traveled there on a day. I I went there 
in the morning and came back to Vienna in the evening and because I'm, I'm working for them since, I don't know, maybe two years. And so I thought, yeah, maybe just, just see those guys. I mean, I've seen photos, but it's not the same thing. And so I met one of the editors who quit this year in spring. So, yeah. And so uh, I just suggested to this gentleman, to this monk gentleman that we go to Munich together and have a chat with the editors. And he's like, yeah, but but do they do they want it or something like that? And so this this is I, I don't know. I think it's really for me it's really strange that you work with people. Uh, I mean, okay, um, you're not in the same city and it's I don't know um, on a different continent. But in this case, it's it's not the case. And so I'm I'm just I just want to say that some people for me it's strange don't want the, the personal relationship, apparently. And I have the impression that there are, and especially those people who want it less, less and less, those are younger people. And they, I think they don't even know anymore what, what a real friendship or, I don't know, a professional relationship is in person. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, well, yeah. I, I think people have relationships in like their idea of relationships are different from our idea of relationships. So I think people do have different relationships. I know like there are shut-ins and, you know, those exceptions, but I think it's just that we, we consider relationships differently. I, I think, yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's all. I don't know. That's I'm, I have to I'm say. really, I'm really worried about people because if you continue like this, eventually we will, we will not, even interact with each other in in real life we will only have our computers and smartphones and only communicate through that and never actually look into the eyes of someone else yeah well that's why i think that's why um last time or two times ago you suggested that you asked the question like should we yeah. find you know our local uh, yeah, I mean, the pixel I mean, S of people, you know, know, and know. meet them. So, yeah, you know, yeah, would that be possible? Um, I mm. know, like some people, some of them are in Ontario, so I can, I should get to, uh, yeah. you know, contacting them and just hanging out. Yeah, you know? I mean, uh, yeah. I, I don't I, know if anyone's in a... Vienna or uh, where Garrett or that's, that's is. That's the thing. So. I know several people, and I I try to reach out to them, but <laughs> are, are they weird, out, weirded out? <laughs> there are, <laughs> They're there, like, oh, I, I don't several, want. <laughs> Yeah. For example, there are several uh, dark table users, okay. but somehow I cannot get them together. We had yeah. last year, we had one meeting about more than one year ago. And I, I, I keep trying to, well, guys, what about the meeting? We haven't seen each other yeah. in, I don't know, one year, but it's somehow, I don't know. Well, there's also I mean, boundaries. There's also boundaries. Yeah. Like certain people uh, don't want to, you know, associate, like they, they want, um a compartmentalized kind of uh relationship right so when like i met this per these people um on you know the the forum i will just keep my you know my relationship within the forum so there's that too you know it's it's fair right like we can't force anyone to do what they don't want yeah, to I'm, that's, um, that's, so. that's what i was going to say we cannot force people to anything so yeah yeah yeah, yeah. garrett so yeah, I think there are um, two things that uh, neither of you have brought up. And uh, firstly, that is uh, people do have like a family life. Um, I know like uh, a lot of uh, colleagues uh, when I was working in the office of Susa uh, years ago, um, they would, uh, we wouldn't be able to meet up uh, many of the times, even if they wanted to, because they already had prior obligations with their, their family. Um, so like their spouse and uh, kids in many cases. Um, and those know, kids yes. are really kind of stretched thin, basically. Um, so like we always had a lot of fun whenever we could find the time to to hang out. But um, whenever, uh, but like so often they're like, oh, I, I have to, you know, take care of my kids or, or go, you know, 
we had something planned or we're having dinner at that time and things like that right so yeah and also like i feel like a lot of people may not be as economically um safe as some other people so they're they're working like multiple jobs or they're they're having really odd shifts and stuff like that so like i think we we assume yeah. things about people and um just a lot of people have really hard lives or really busy lives mm -hmm. so it's not like they don't want those things to happen but they they just have so much on their plate to deal with like for me i i shared some of it right on the forum but it's it's just really overwhelming and you know and then yeah. like, we're also still in the midst of a pandemic so yeah. like the global yeah. thing where it, it's people are really, people more than others yeah it, it's uh anytime you meet up with someone outside of your household there is a big risk that you can uh get this disease that's spread through the air that you can uh you know either wind up dying from or being permanently disabled from um yeah. you know best case scenario for many people is that they're sick for a few weeks and they can't do anything for that time but um uh the thing is with covid um every time you get it you're more susceptible to getting it later on and yeah, then long, addition, long COVID, things okay. keep uh mutating too to become yeah. uh, more transmissible so like it's yeah i don't I, mean, I don't know what to feel about COVID, it, but I, I still don't because it's it's like you have a hundred people right they're mm -hmm. all infected but then the the you know the their symptoms and what happens to them in the long run are all different so it's you that's know there are patterns for polio yeah, yeah. and for any other yeah. disease that's easily transmissible yeah, so, like so we're trying to polio to like everybody out, knows so. long polio but nobody uh seems to remember like uh yeah. all of, because a lot of us are young too young for it that uh that a lot of people were asymptomatic and uh were, were spread uh you know it, it was spread where people didn't even know that they had it and then other, yeah. uh, a lot of people just got sick for a while you know like most yeah. the majority of people got sick for a while but you know like with polio it was only about one percent who uh had long polio and that's the disease known as polio today and actually now some survivors uh like uh my um sister-in-law's mother uh has to walk around on crutches because of it you know um this this is a thing um but like every uh virus it has the possibility to have like a, a long version of it where you're you're affected by life but like covid it's between 15 to 33 percent uh depending on the estimate and the def definition of long covid um whether it's a wide umbrella uh term or like more narrow um but the number is quite high and uh so a lot of people really don't want to take the risk um and uh rightfully so i mean so like every time you meet up with anyone else it's a risk yeah yeah so like but, even uh, even in my own space i uh, mm -hmm. uh, i try to be really careful although like in our where i live right now there's like no no need for a mask not even testing uh, we are talking about a second booster, but that's about it. So, yeah, it's just the attitudes are so different um, between people and among governments. So, go ahead. Well, yeah, every, they're, they're not taking uh, precautionary measures like uh, they used to, or in some cases at all. But um, that's a big problem. But uh, my point is, is uh, you have to take a risk whenever you go out and whenever you meet other people. And uh, so you kind of have to like weigh it. And then like some people are more willing to meet up other with others in smaller groups. Some people are more willing to meet outside. Um, but like, you know, a, a lot of people aren't really willing to meet up with the random stranger who has traveled for a while, you know, to them, like, right. Um, so I don't it know. Um, but like they might not yeah. and say that directly, and that's my point. Uh -huh. But then also, additionally, um, like I said, you know, family obligations and such. So those are very valid reasons, and people don't necessarily communicate exactly why they might not be able to meet up. But yeah, there's some other ones. Um, 
Does anybody know why this year there was no Libre Graphics meeting so far? Because as far as I know, it it was supposed to happen in Sri Lanka. But in Sri Lanka, there's that political trouble. I, I don't know. Do you know anything about that? So. Well, the news I just heard about um, just not having enough money to go around. Like the government is bankrupt and you know so they're they're just chasing out their current administration and they're yeah i know that i think I they're that. Yeah. But, yeah but yeah so nobody knows anything about no, no, no. GM. I, I think it's just i i just think it's covid mm. related um, 20, yeah. 20, 23 nobody knows anything about it because we cannot we cannot we cannot not meet continue to not meet forever i think because yeah like, i mean, just... I mean they, they didn't even talk about any online presence right so yeah. like i'm not connected to uh the the graphics meeting so i i have no idea i never participated in one mm -hmm. but uh i i remember you or someone else posting several times on the forum and you know they're crickets no one knows right so yes um, um... Yeah. Pat so David nothing. should know something should know more. Some somehow I have yeah, the he, feeling he hadn't responded, so yeah. Mm -hmm. Somehow I have the feeling that, that there will be a meeting next year. <laughs> Who knows? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean I, I also had the idea since there was no Libra Graphics meeting this year that we could maybe organize a uh, just a pixels community meeting somehow yeah but we're all over the place i i think there's a lot of americans so they can do their own uh but um, canadians not too much uh maybe a handful i think i think most developers are european yeah and that's and the Europeans. reason why uh that's the reason why most of the time the Libre graphics meeting actually happens in europe uh, it also um, took, took place several times in Canada, I think. I think in Montreal. Yeah, a, f a few times. Yeah. Um, I, I'm just yeah. thinking, like, we can, we could, like, technically bridge the gap. You know, you can have uh, what my workplace is, calls, uh, you know, hybrid, uh, hybrid workspace or hybrid events where. Um, people can meet like in their uh, local region mm -hmm. and then you know you have a telepresence and then you can communicate uh with other people in other areas of the world right so there there's the there's the in-person presence but there's also the uh online virtual presence as well so people can have events at different locations mm -hmm. and also interact with people at different locations so there's that to be explored. You know, they you have to make sure all the technology is in sync, and uh, you have the cameras in this specific rooms or whatever spaces we book, and then uh, you can do that concurrent, have those events concurrently. Um, so that's that's something to explore. It's just um, what how much time people have, as Garrett. Uh, pointed out and also what are sort of the resources we have um i can tell you right now i'm just i just got a new temporary job but i've been unemployed forever due to disability and uh, you know a lot of different family obligations and things like that so i don't have like a sense that i can contribute to something like that um, um you you are in toronto right yeah, I am in Toronto. What if this um, is a theoretical question? Eh? But if if the meeting, the lithographics meeting, or some other meeting happened, uh, took place in Toronto, you would join? Yeah, yeah, I, I would join. Um, in fact, the place that I'm working at for one year, starting uh, July fourth, is called a uh, Center for Social Innovation. So. <laughs> It's not so much a plug for them, but um, basically Center for Social Innovation is that they 
they support entrepreneurs and they support whoever wants to use their space. And so um, they rent out their spaces for um, for a reasonable price. Um, and so, you know, they have two buildings and they have like the, the main floor or the ground floor. Um, they have like a excellent um, place for some a meeting like that. Um, so yeah, it's it's totally doable. I just need to, you know, book the space and uh, sort it out if if everyone's willing to come to Toronto. But um, I'm just saying that uh, it is a possibility. Um, and yeah, since I'm part of the tech infrastructure team, I can get something. You know, I can do uh, cater. Actually, the organization itself caters to its guests and its members. So mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's totally a perfect like low key uh environment unless we have like we grow to the point where we need a stadium we we will we'll never have need a stadium but you know in, in a small intimate place with um everything all the technology catered and um the services catered it would be a excellent location to meet just putting it out there i know it probably won't happen but um there 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 are spaces in Toronto in Canada like that. Um, um, the, the Libra Graphics meeting, uh, as far as I know, once took place in Vienna, and the the actual place was, I think, the um, is it's a school, some kind of university. It's called um, Hochschule. It's not. It's it's something like a minor university for. Um, technology um technicum it's called technicum that's the name of the school it's some kind of te technical university yeah 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 and and so, the location has like a maker space and stuff like that so it's totally and they're like into you know open sourcing their ideas and stuff like that so like i think it would be a good fit like center for social innovation um, university, I don't have any connections with universities at this point. So, mm -hmm. um, like, I, I have my the, the university that I went to, but I don't, I'm not connected to the people there. Mm -hmm. So, um, no, not so much university. But I, I mean, like, these are ideas that that can be mm -hmm. floated around. Yeah, it's sure. just again, like Garrett's point is, just even without the pandemic and all this thing, all these things going on, it's just really hard to get people to to meet because people have their own lives and their own reasons uh, why they cannot make it. And people like me, I tend to want to make it to a lot of things. But like if travels, any, you know, a question or just like things just come up all the time in my life. So it's, it's just really hard to I can promise, but then I may disappoint. Right. So there's a um, lot of that. Did you know that as far as the Limpia graphics meeting is concerned, uh, they if if you if you, if you have good reasons, they can refund you one part of your traveling costs. Yeah, and I I know that there's there's also an online thing that they have, right? So mm -hmm. then, like um, all their they, um, they have workshops like and this, things are. Yeah, uh, yeah, they had they had it twice, but this year there's nothing apparently. And I honestly, honestly. Um, I don't know. I don't. It, it, it's it's quite. It's it's an online meeting, but um, I think it's not a real meeting because it's just uh, presentations and some people writing into the chat, and that's what it is. Well, so we can make it more interactive. It's just <laughs> you know you need to pay more for it, and you need yeah. more than Ishvan to um, <laughs> uh, host mm -hmm. it. You know, you need a team to host uh, like a more. Um, integrated event right it's not mm -hmm. as simple as just having one person um like buying into uh, google meet and you know setting mm -hmm. it up um so we need all the primary drivers like pat to um to kind of you know make it more official um and you know all the people behind pixels uh, I don't know. Uh, one, just one last question is Anna. Do you have any um, event coordinating or event planning experience? No, not really. I think. 
Okay. Mm, so things. like I think one one thing is if we were to do something more official and more like like kind of Libra graphics meeting um level, mm -hmm. we need some people who are um you know event coordinator um mm. Planning who have types. experience. Uh, experience. Like I, I have I have a lot of uh, nonprofit or volunteer experience, but I, I haven't had any paid experience. So I can I can probably contribute a lot to to that. Um, you know, there's there's the marketing, there's the budgeting, you know, there's the you know, finding the guests and you know, making the, the arrangements and all that stuff, right? So there's a lot to to deal with. Um, you know, if, yeah, it, if you we would, have you like would. a local thing, then, you know, for the speakers, for the plenaries and stuff like that, you know, you also have to give honorariums to people, you know, there's, <laughs> there's a lot of things that, um, you, you know, one would have to do or, or like, it could be a more informal, but those things are still like, those things still need to be addressed. Like if, it, uh, if, you know, a less formal degree but you still have to check off all those boxes so it's it's not as simple as like we would assume those yeah, things to be would, um and i would. think that's why that's why libra graphics meeting you know they have all this stuff you know they, they're thinking should we even entertain you know all that because like whether the event is super small even virtual you still have to have all those elements come together before something can happen. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yes. Um, definitely. Definitely. If we if we would uh, organize a real meeting, we would definitely need a team and not just one single guy. Yeah. And, like a, at least a committee, like a yes. kind of a planning and, or steering committee to kind of sort it out. And then who is willing to be on even that? Right. So that's yeah. so. Well, as as far as the Libra Graphics meeting is concerned, there, there, it it happened. It, it ha used to happen every year, and there were lots of people who came. So there were at the last meeting there were I think several several hundred participants. So yeah, so so the the interest is there. It's just who's yeah. gonna get the ball rolling, right? Will it be Anna's? <laughs> who knows right well like who who will be the um the people right so yeah i think um one last no go go on i i i i, for, I lost my train of thought no i'm i'm just listening to you <laughs> well, I, I think a lot of people are not comfortable with uh, traveling uh far distances to meet uh, a large group of people still i mean the pandemic is still ongoing yes so like it it was great to meet people in person before the pandemic but like it always carries uh, quite a big risk now so it, it, yeah and oh i i remember what i, mean, I wanted to add lgm yeah. did oh, happen uh, last year in 2021 and it was in person with a small group of people but uh as far as like this year i don't know it is it has been radio silence. I did a few searches around and, and can't find anything about um, any information for this year. So I no, assume neither, neither do I. Late into the year, I think it's just not going to happen because it's always been um, like previous, you know, uh, months in the year, um, each year. So yeah, I remember what I wanted to say. Um, it's not just travel, um, like. The willingness to travel but it's also the restrictions for travel um right now like in canada we don't have restrictions but the issue is there's a lot of uncertainty like how mm -hmm. to how to get travel working um like if you read the news canadian news like our airports i think half of their staff were gone or 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 let go yeah. so so they simply cannot process like people have bought tickets they have travel plans but yes. they're they're canceled last minute or they they they're just in the airport forever without knowing what's going on and uh we have 300,000 or 400,000 um passports that are renewed or try like people submitted their applications did everything 
um, but they're still waiting for their passports like two years or one year later. Um, so there's a, like so much uncertainty um, in that area as well. So even if I wanted to travel tomorrow, I don't have my passport yet. Mm -hmm. I, I, I did everything correctly. Uh, my passport wasn't expired and when I applied it. So it should be really f you know, fast tracking, right? But I still don't have it. And they, they sent me information saying that, or a letter saying that I, don't, I didn't provide enough information, even though I did. <laughs> so I tried calling them and they hang up right away. It's like an automatic hang up. So like, there's no way I'm going to get my passport basically uh, within one or two years. Um, so so how years? am I going to travel? Years? Maybe, maybe, to... maybe, I don't know. Like there's, there's, there's no information, <laughs> right? So, so there's a lot of people encountering this problem as well. Um, like just the logistics of getting, getting there and, and with COVID-19 and with everything else, the economic issues mm -hmm. that are happening. Um, well, I, I think like talking about Libra graphics meeting, like maybe people aren't, they want to do it, but they're, they're so preoccupied. They're not even thinking about it. Like mm -hmm. it can be as simple as that, right? There, it's not that they're not interested, but there's, they're, they're just overwhelmed by everything else that like, it's just, it's, just, it's not slipping their mind. It's just not, it's a non-issue right now. <laughs> I don't know. I know, like, like you really want want one to happen. You want to go to there, and I think I'm sure a lot of people do. But for the, for the like regular person, it's like really low on their um, um, priority list. There's one thing I want to mention in this context. So there had been lockdowns for years now because of 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 COVID. And at the moment, there are no restrictions at all here in Europe. And there are yeah, yeah, I here understand, in Vienna. But, but yeah, let me finish. Here okay. in Vienna, there are so ex there are so extremely many people tourists, tourists. So people now are allowed to travel. And uh, suddenly there are so many, there are much more tourists than before the pandemic. They are just people are just crazy to travel now now that they can and so there are problems with with the flights flights are being cancelled and there's not enough stuff etc etc yet there are ex there's an extreme amount of tur tourists here yeah but there are also well, lots of trains and you uh should also be aware that uh in within germany uh, the whole entire train network is uh, nine euros for the entire month to uh, to take the the train network, except for the uh, the express trains. So, like, if somebody wants to travel mm -hmm. from Munich to Vienna, for example, they can hop on uh, a, a slower train, not one of the express uh, ones, and be there. Um, and they can do that as much as they want for the entire month for nine euros. So, like, there have been a lot of people, at least within Germany, have been traveling. Um, as a result of the, the lower prices, um, you know, whether that's like a short distance uh, travel or maybe even within their own city or like all the way across Germany. But like the thing is, Vienna is not um, that far from Germany. So like that probably influences the... Uh, that those tourists, those tourists aren't, most of them aren't, I don't know, maybe there are lots of Germans, but I think there are a lot of people from Southern Europe, Spain, Italy, um, probably also South America. I've not Turkey, probably. Yes. Uh, so I, I have not especially noticed Germans. Probably there are also lots of Germans, but uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so just just wanted to mention it. Now that people can, can travel and they do. <laughs> there are I think it's people. a case... Well, what I was going to say is a case by case thing. Um, it's, you know, I, I talk to a lot of people and they have different experiences, but the general experience is travel is really difficult to achieve. Uh, I know like, you know, within Europe, you know, there, there are ways like such as the train, um, but there's also uh, travel agencies, right? To, 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 to know the ins and outs of like the, what's going on. And so it's much easier to um, go through an agency 
to travel. But um, if we're talking about off continent, like like North America to Europe, yeah. even the agencies are struggling to to get get things done for um, for the uh, for travelers. So even the, like a lot of agencies are just saying, no, that's we're not going to do that business. We're not going to um, figure it out for you. So think about individuals who are not going through agencies if agencies are already telling people that they're not going to do that kind of business anymore so uh, you know there's like the the theme of the our discussion is you can't just assume that people can have that have that kind of access or you can't just assume that people will like they they may have the desire to join a meeting but they may it's not may not be possible for them um and you can't like thirdly you can't force people to to come together especially when it's such a huge commitment as travel so i mean it would be great if we met right right um but it's it's not i don't know feasible or realistic um to me maybe in five years when we're um, older and actually, wiser <laughs> actually in theory in theory i i have been thinking about visiting you alan <laughs> okay yeah, there. I mean, there's a bunch of us in Ontario. Um, there's other people, other provinces, like a couple. But um, yeah, you know. Uh, last year, yes, last year I've um, I visited. Yes, we met. Um, last year, I, I mentioned this already. I went to Utrecht and and met a road therapy developer. And I went to Karlsruhe and met met uh, Johannes. Yeah, so yes, so I could especially yeah, um, yeah, just just mentioning it. Yeah. <laughs> I could also I I also thought about uh, visiting Micah. Yeah, yeah, Maybe. um, yeah. Like if you come to North America, like a bunch of us are in North America, so. I mean, you could like do a, like a tour <laughs> if you wanted to. Um, yeah, like uh, you know, all these places. Like Toronto is an interesting place, although it's still trying to find its identity now. <laughs> but it's uh, you know, Canada um, and the states. We have a lot of different parks and lots of different landscapes. Um, um, although that... your landscape uh, discussion more uh, focused on other areas, but uh, North America is pretty nice too um i think the niagara falls are close to toronto aren't they yeah yeah it's uh oh i forget how long like it just depends how fast you drive <laughs> um yeah niagara falls um but we have a lot of like nice provincial parks and in the states there's a lot of nice um national parks uh we talked about um you know the birds photography um you know how how you know th some of it is really unique like you know when we talked about that that site um quite often when you travel you see photographs of like well like millions of people have taken photographs at certain locations but even niagara falls there's like other falls nearby that are just as beautiful i'm just saying that uh, north america is a really large place like Canada, Ontario, all these places. Like there's so many nooks and crannies that are really, really interesting uh, that people just don't talk about. Um, same thing as Europe, anywhere in the world, right? So no matter where you go in the world, um, you can't say like some areas have better, like more beautiful mm -hmm. landscapes than others. I believe everywhere has their like uniqueness unless it's all paved over <laughs> then it's it's different but uh th those are urban landscapes so to speak right so um actually that's what i really wanted to say on those threads but never got a chance um i think we are kind of running long i i realized that uh i i don't know uh when ishtan uh is is thinking of um calling it quits so yes. what what do you think <laughs> Uh, and our, our discussion has, you know, kind of focused on other things. Um, so, do do are you guys okay if we close? And I think the the question that um, I 
at post, uh, I think half an hour ago was, you know, do we want our our uh, live meetings to be uh, more regular. more regular or mm -hmm. just okay? Yeah, we'll see. We'll see. I don't know. Um, maybe maybe leave some spontane spontan spontaneity. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. That's because um, uh, I, I think if it's all presentations, it'll be kind of dry. Yeah, yeah. And but so um, yeah. There should well, not if it's be... dark table, well, if it's dark table, people will have so many questions lined up. So mm -hmm. if we're doing a dark table uh, session, then it'll just be like, you know, half uh, presentation and half all questions because I feel like generally after the presentations, we don't have enough time to um, to discuss anything or or field questions. But today, because we only had five people, right? Uh, so I think I believe we asked you know, exhausted all the questions we had for Ian. But uh, that's one piece of feedback I had. Uh, it's just, we just didn't have enough time for people to ask questions and for a healthy discussion. Um, so yeah. yeah um, what I was oh, going my, to say, think... uh, okay. Oh. Uh, please speak, Garrett. Garrett? Okay, sure. Uh, yeah, uh, Darktable uh, 4 came out recently. So it would have been nice to talk more about that. And like, uh, it has uh, uh, some new features and such. It would have been cool to hear like feedback and tips and tricks and stuff like that. Um, yeah, I know I'm, I'm not really a big fan of the, the new filter system, just because it, it's like duplication of like, now, now we have like three different areas to filter instead of just like yeah. one. And uh, the stars are not really intuitive, in my opinion. Um, but like, there are some nice parts of it. However, like you know, like the, the text filtering across a bunch of different fields, you can have them at the, the top, for example. Um, but yeah. you know, and then uh, there's a big thread on um, on pixels right now about the uh, the different uh, the new color science of uh, film, like the the new version. Yeah, there's out. a lot. So um, there's like. Two or three threads on that. Uh, so, like, it would have been uh, nice to hear like some discussion about that. I, I think, and like, basically, whenever there's like new software releases that are pretty big of any of the, um, the tools. I mean, I'm just using Darktable mm -hmm. as an example. Uh, then it would be cool to to hear more about that. Like, I, I've been playing release. around a bit with the new color tools in Darktable, and I think they work really well, and the colors look look really good. So. Oh, Aurelia did something really nice. Yeah, this, I this, noticed some gotchas this today. Time. Like, if you have some uh, like white paper, like uh, it would be like really blue, and you can't read the text on it by default. Mm -hmm. um, oh and, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I, I know uh, what that problem is. There yeah. are those. Uh, those. I mean, um, I know ways of working around that, but saturation, like saturation. Um, are you have you been playing around with those? um saturation options in so that's yeah. what changing it to, to the make. luminance yeah luminance mode exactly. just fixes it for like that photo in particular uh, but, however uh, there is one thing i noticed in um that has to do with um diffuse shop and um it tends i noticed that it tends to produce a blue cast in the shadows when I when I watch, really? oh. I, I switch on um, diffuse shop mm. yeah, I mean it's it's possible to fix it with uh, color balance RGB. Well, yeah, um, yeah, okay. Yeah, shadow. Another preset for it. Uh, do you want an example? I mean, you could just share it with. Uh... Um, on, on a thread or something that would be easier yeah, yeah. i, I, yeah, I did think are about maybe, it uh, are you using opencl maybe maybe there's a bug i don't know i'm using opencl and i, I don't see that however let's mm. just say that shadows do do have color um so yes, if you yes, if yes. you increase the uh saturation or saturation. you move the hue around it will um affect it uh adversely generally what i do is uh -huh. i just I just mask out the um, shadows so that I can deal with that later because mm -hmm. shadows are really tricky in that it has a lot of noise and it also has a lot of color noise. 
and it also has color that like if you brighten it the shadow or you do something with the shadow it kind of looks weird do, do, does that make sense um, like like say if you look if you um have dark vision right like if you are in a dark room or something like everything is like kind of grayish right but really all those objects have color so if you add more uh make it more colorful or you do something with it then it looks really odd does that make sense so it could be just that like a perception thing um, oh, okay it's I yeah, like you said, so it has just said to uh, do... do you see the comment? Okay. So we're finished for today. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, thanks for Ishran for um hosting this and you know for the yeah, few, thank you. few dollars or euros or <laughs> and I I hope we'll see each other soon again yeah so if you have any breadcrumbs just just put it on the thread so that we can you know pick up from where we mm. left off okay yeah okay so, have a great day everyone or bye. night <laughs> good night or good time. morning bye okay bye, -bye.